so that we've really been able to study sleep in a laboratory looking at how the brain changes during sleep, classifying sleep into different stages. Right. So it's only been since about that time that we've been able mm. to study it. So it's really very recent. It's almost it's very as recent. recent as some other aspects of uh, psychosexual right. therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, um, uh, Dr. Orr, how much sleep do people really need? Because we very often we have such discussions about that. Sure, sure. People need as much sleep, Ruth, as it takes to keep them awake in the daytime. You may need, Larry was saying earlier, you only need a very little amount of sleep, maybe four or five hours a night. Another person may need six or seven hours. And the way you judge how much sleep you need in the, at night is how you feel in the daytime. If you feel alert, if you are functioning adequately during the daytime, you're getting enough sleep. So there's really no rule or regulation no that a rule. woman of such and such an age... That's correct. Uh, is it true that there was once a woman who needed only one or two yes, hours? It it's <laughs> absolutely true. Tell me that secret. Can you imagine what I could do? I could do another television That's program. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all sleep only one hour a day? What this woman, in fact, woman? was yeah. absolutely shown through these physiologic studies that are done to sleep only one hour a day. She was a, a lady who lived in London. Hmm. And some people who actually run a sleep laboratory heard about her, got in touch with her, and asked her if she would be willing to undergo a study. They investigated her in the laboratory. Which means she slept in a sleep laboratory? She was wired with the electrodes, and they, in fact, documented that she slept only one hour and 24 and hours. <laughs> and she complained about that. Because she, she thought she shouldn't need that That's hour. right. She said, why should I but sleep one hour? hour that we'll give her that. <laughs> right. A little bit exaggerated. What are larks and owls? Well, these are individuals who have very different sleep habits. A lark is a person who basically stays up till 2 o'clock in the morning. At 8 o'clock in the morning, he's a zombie. He yes. can't function at all. <laughs> he, if he had his choice, yes. or she, <laughs> yes. would go to bed at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and sleep till 10 or 11, and would, in fact, function perfectly if allowed to do that. That's Usually, the lark. That's the lark. Now, our society normally doesn't permit that. Right, because the, people go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. They have to be at right. work at 8. Right. The owl, on the other hand, excuse me, that was the owl. The person who likes to stay up late night, is the owl, right? right. The, the lark night. is the person who gets up early in the morning. Five or six o'clock in the morning, they're awake, they're ready to go, they feel terrific. And it just infuriates everyone when they come to work and, boy, they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. But seven or eight o'clock at night, they're getting tired, sleepy. By ten o'clock, they're in bed. Now, two things. One is uh, when a lark marries an owl, that's right. there are problems. I hear this myself, frequently. <laughs> and the other thing is, can, let's suppose a couple falls in love with mm -hmm. each other, can a lark learn to be an owl? It's very tough, Ruth, and it, in, in fact, it's a real problem in many marriages, mm -hmm. because it is very difficult for a lark to become an owl or an owl to become a lark. I believe, personally, there are certain genetic predispositions for a person to be a lark or be an owl. Oh. Now, you can change a little bit, mm -hmm. but I don't think you can ever really take a a lark and, and turn them into a real true bona fide owl. How interesting. So if it's genetic, but let me ask you something else. Since I talk a lot about sex, is sleep better or deeper uh, or more satisfying after sex? Well, I don't know that I could say that it's deeper, but I certainly know that it is a very, very effective hypnotic. In fact, in many ways, it could substitute for a sleeping pill. It works very well. Yeah, yeah. So everybody right. out there. Now, that means that if the sexual experience has been satisfying, uh, then people... It's easier to sleep. Relax more. That's right. And, exactly. and, and can easier... And then they sleep better. Uh, ...fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I have a question to you. Sure. Um, is there any physiological reason? Because I always say there's none, that it's just a bad habit. But maybe you, the expert, um, uh, maybe, they, maybe I'm wrong. Is there a physiological reason why so many women complain that their partners, right after orgasm, right after ejaculation, mm -hmm. turn around and fall asleep, while the woman, because the resolution period is yeah. slower, yeah. tosses and really wants to be held? I don't know that there's a good physiologic reason for that, except to say that immediately after an orgasm and ejaculation, as you say, the man immediately, his penis detumesces, and he relaxes. It, 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 it's like a big explosion and there's a very quick detumescence and relaxation in the whole body, At that moment. which promotes sleep. Right. 
So in, in, in the woman, it takes a longer time. It takes a longer period of time, exactly. But uh, am I correct by saying that uh, men can uh, learn uh, to stay awake for a little while? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. they very definitely oh, can learn I'm to glad. do that. That's right. <laughs> Dr. Orr, tell me something. Tell me about snoring. How many people do I hear who say they can't sleep with their beloved in one room because he snores? Snoring is obviously an extremely common problem. It is particularly noted in men, of course. And it's, it is the sign we think now, it is a legitimate medical complaint, we feel at this point in time, because we know that certain individuals who do snore and snore loudly can have an underlying medical disorder called sleep apnea. Now, all snorers do not have sleep apnea, but we know now that it is a problem and a complaint that should be taken seriously. 10 or 15 years ago, most physicians would joke about it or laugh about it. And say, live with it. And say, live with it. Mm -hmm. Now we know that these, many of these individuals should be studied in a sleep laboratory and oftentimes are found to have an actual breathing disorder during and sleep. And it can be... And it can be corrected. It can be corrected. Mm -hmm. I'm sending a certain person in my life to Oklahoma okay. very fast. <laughs> now, in your sleep uh, laboratory... Um, I do know that one aspect of your work is the treatment of um, impotence, mm -hmm. the treatment of uh, men who have difficulties having an erection. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, the reason that we get involved in this, it would seem a little bit peculiar that a sleep physiologist would get involved in individuals who have problems with sexual impotence. The reason we do is because we know that a normal part of sleep is dreaming. Right. It's what we call rapid eye movement sleep. And one of the normal physiologic aspects of this is men have erections. I, it, uh, I was taught, and I don't know if it's correct anymore, I was first taught that every 90 minutes during REM sleep a man has an erection. That's correct. Which sometimes lasts for 15 minutes. Oh, yes. Is that still? That's absolutely still? true. And mm -hmm. uh, that you can actually trace... The, not only the length, the, the, the time of the erection, right. but you can uh, trace the strength of the erection. That's right. You can uh, Tell me what happens when a man does get in the morning the printout that he had erection even though he thought that he's mm -hmm. impotent. Well, it's very interesting because what that tells us is the man is physiologically capable of having a normal erection. Right. And one of the nice therapeutic aspects of this is that you can show the man that, look, you are capable of having a normal erection. And in fact, what we're saying is probably true. This is in your head, primarily. This is psychological impotence. You should be able to obtain a normal erection. Very interesting. And it's very confidence building. Yeah, because uh, that's why you are working with a urologist and a psychiatrist. Exactly. Because if that man walks out and says, aha, I have nothing physiologically wrong, then there's a psychological problem. That's right. Now give me an example of when it is a physiological problem, when mm -hmm. you and the urologist work rather than you and the psychiatrist. Okay. In a situation where we do a sleep study on the individual who has normal looking rapid eye movement sleep or dreaming sleep, and we don't see the erections, the little tracing that you described is flat. In a situation like that, we would presume that this individual has a physiologic or physical basis mm -hmm. for the complaint of impotence. And then he would work with Dr. William Barnes, who is our urologist, and we would proceed along the lines of some type of physical treatment for the impotence rather than referring him to the psychiatrist. Right. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I do have to end, but I have one more fast question. Will you eventually, in the future, will you be able to detect what people dream about? Can, can you, that can doesn't you seem to be on the horizon, Ruth. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I'm glad because, God forbid, if somebody dreams about really something knew. that I don't want you to know. That's right. <laughs> Thank you it's my so pleasure. very much I for it. being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Don't go away. We'll be back with more of your phone calls right after these messages.